Hello everyone, Richie Carlton here. Welcome to, what is today? Tuesday. Boy, I tell you, it's been a long couple days for sure. Uh, we are here doing live FileMaker training and talking about all sorts of things that are FileMaker specific. Today I'm a little bit bigger. If you find myself too grossly large or too intimidating, then I will uh, dial myself down to a smaller size for you. Uh, today is not so much about FileMaker demo, it is about talking about important things to keep in mind. Um, initially this was t called the five things, uh, tips for, you know, five things a successful businesses do. It was kind of a generic YouTube topic, uh, but everyone here already uses FileMaker, so me telling you that if you have a brain you'll use FileMaker. I mean, most people understand that you know, FileMaker has a benefit. Now, it doesn't fit some organizations, but it fits probably more than most, right? I would say if you took 100 situations where you had a technical issue and some sort of problem automation you had to solve, FileMaker would solve 90% of them. Uh, so anyway, today is all about that. Helping today is uh, David Castillo. David Castillo, are you there? I am. Hey. Hey, sounds good too. Awesome. So we kind of threw this together at the last second. Uh, I would definitely want to encourage questions and answers. So yeah, Top Cat says it's 10 p.m. So uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So that's uh, less fun. So anyway, I just want to uh, touch base with everyone. Make sure that you ask questions along the way because it's not so technical today, right? It's about you know some general concepts. So in May for me, it's 30 years. Of course. Given all that's gone on, I don't think there's going to be much of a party or anything like that. It's like 30 years in a job. It's like, don't you get like the, the keys to the city or something? I don't, I don't know. So anyway, yeah. So uh, <laughs> I get uh, what do I get? What do I get for May? I get FileMaker 19, right? And so, uh, and we will be covering a ton of FileMaker 19 as we get into launch. But that's still, I don't know exactly when. Sometime in May. So figure 45 days plus or minus. Uh, so we're trying to get all the training and stuff up to date and done. So uh, if you have questions along the way, so today we're going to take this topic instead of saying it's generic FileMaker, we're going to basically uh, twist the conversation a little bit and say that these are the things that I have learned that make life much easier or lead to greater levels of success with the FileMaker platform. Not necessarily technical. In fact, most things in the world of FileMaker are not technical. When you when you get jacked up or screwed up and something bad happens with a project, rarely it's really technical. It's most of the time now you might not you might have a technical problem you don't know how to solve, but that's a most of the time a training issue. Um, and I'm not picking on anyone. I've even had that before. I we can tell story I can tell stories for hours. So the the issue is to identify some common things that will help you, I think, out there if you're watching this video. And once again, if you are live, the benefit to being live is you can interact with us. So Dave and I will be answering questions here. Canada, Dennis in Canada, Top Cat from uh I think he said it was uh Top Cat said I think it was a net no no, that was the yeah, Top Cat's the Netherlands. Dave is from, uh, where's Dave from? England, right? You're all over the place. I mean, I, I don't know how many people are even here from the U.S. right now. So um, anyway, mostly everyone's uh, supposed to be at home working uh, at home, not going in the office so much unless you have a mission critical uh a mission critical application or something that's running where that's needed. And we do have that. So parts of RCC, um, I have to go in the office sometimes, but we are supporting some pharmaceutical companies in their activities. You can imagine what that's like. So it's a little bit crazy. So Topcat's been using FileMaker uh, for five years, but had a database history before that. And uh, I was going to say, I keep saying Echo Fox Truck Golf, but that's, uh, he said his name up here is El... Elzo. El I keep saying Enzo, but it's Elzo. E-L-Z-O. I think that's Elzo, right? Um, and he has been using FileMaker for about six years. So some of these things you have heard about, most of them in six years, you start to see most of it, seven years. Um, so let's kind of dive into that once again. And David, you can help me. And then uh, and then uh, Ed uh, Ed is there. And uh, Rick is Richard is large and in charge. Yeah, I sorry about that. So if you want me to be smaller, just let me know. But it's I'm not really competing for space with uh, FileMaker at the moment. Now, if something happens, we need to dive into FileMaker. I'm completely prepared to go down that road. So um, what I have over here is kind of a slideshow. Um, and so these are just things they are not in any specific order. Uh, these are just tips and, and thoughts and processes. So in the world of FileMaker, but this goes for any technology that you're going to roll out. And I keep throwing this cord over here. It's supposed to say behind me. There we go. Um, in the world of FileMaker, 
Um, basically, what you want to do is you want to be able to show ROI, return on investment. Whenever we go to even I go to I go to Claris and I talk to them and say you should do you know back in the day when I made suggestions which I don't anymore, uh, what they should do, they would always want to see a financial justification. So before you ever open your mouth about, hey, you should do this or do this or do this, for example, if we went to them, so from the conversation yesterday talking about FileMaker's licensing strategy, and it seems to make sense that the clients would be free. So if you went to them and say FileMaker Pro should be free, they would say, what is the justification for that? And the justification would be, um, what you would say is that, well, more people will use the product locally on their devices. You'll have a greater grassroots effort, not that they care about that. You'll have more people using it, playing with it, getting applications to work. And then when they start to share them with a team, then FileMaker slash Claris would collect money. And that would be, that's great words, but, they, but, but some companies like Claris, they, they doesn't matter to them at all. They want to actually, you to tell them exactly how much money they will make plus or minus a million dollars. And, uh, and of course, so that's why FileMaker Pro isn't free because no one has been able to make that case yet. If you could make that case that I could increase their sales $10 million in the next three months, they'd make Pro free tomorrow, right? So, but you have to be able to show that and show the evidence. You just can't make it up, but that's how they are. Well, that's how organizations are. If you work in an organization, unless you're the boss now at RCC, I'm the boss, but even I, before I decide that we're going to go this way or go this way or whatever we're going to do, there's an ROI. If I invest in this, I commit funds and capital to this direction, what are we going to get out of it? So when you're building a project for a customer, you want to think about going after the low-hanging fruit, going after the things that are simple for you to develop and automate that show a high ROI. So for example, the bottom one here, you have a staff member that spends 23, 20 or 30 hours every week doing some sort of, uh, say you have an automatic process where she is going to, or he or she, in my case it's a she, goes through the uh, a billing system and checks to see who's late and then and looks at it and then flips the record and then says, email the person. And maybe she outputs it and then she mails it and so you could automate that job with a script that would do it for them. And so instead of spending 20 or 30 hours a week, this person spends a couple hours, right? That is money in the bank. Those kinds of things you want to do for customers. You want to keep your eye on that ball. And when you're first getting in with customers, if you're establishing the reputation, you want to be able to show that return on investment. If you can't do that, I mean, it's one thing to be in a meeting and talk to talk and you're shaking hands and doing deals and all this. You got to deliver on that, right? If you're an outside consultant, you have to deliver. If you're one of my coaches, you have to deliver that training to the person so they see the ROI on that. If you're an in-house developer or you're a manager in-house, maybe you have Maybe you just happen to be here looking at this and you have some people talking about FileMaker. Those FileMaker people, if they have a brain, will actually go after a process or an automation where they can automate something and save the organization money. Time or money, which are the same things, or they somehow speed a process up, which allows you to get to market faster, right? Makes sense. So that's kind of a topic there. Um, hey, John from Pennsylvania, right on. Stuck at home, time to improve FileMaker skills. I can't tell you, John, how that makes me happy that when you say things like that. And of course, once again, here I have to put on my radio announcer voice. <clears throat> this live training session is sponsored by FileMakerTraining.tv or FMTraining.tv where you can get the latest in training resources inexpensively. Visit FMTraining.tv. Okay, so that's that. So back to this. So um, I, had to, I have to do that at least once during an episode so you know how to do that. So you visit fmtraining.tv and feel free to uh, keep your uh, membership up to date. If you have training, you can get the bundle, a, a more complete bundle, which gets you all the training, which is really great. Um, and so think about that. So next item on the list, if I go down my list here. So remember, okay, so back up. I want to hit this. ROI, the bottom one. If a staff spends 20 or 30 hours a week and you can automate that down to five hours, no one says no to that unless politics are at play. And office politics are like a constant of the universe, right? 
I mean, people could be dying and you'll have people who hate Trump up his ass about stuff, right? And maybe you're one of those people, that's fine. But uh, I just, it just sometimes you gotta shelve the politics and just focus on objectives and getting stuff done. And you can hate people, you can hate the new prime minister of the UK, um, you know, Angela Merkel, whatever, politics and stuff. It's like, he did this, no, he did this. It's like, man, sometimes you have to set that aside. When you can save 25 hours of labor on a staff person, you just save the company, depending on where you're at and what you're paying the person, 20, 30, 50, 80 thousand dollars a year. That's real money. If someone says no to saving that, they're up to something else. It's just the way it is. No one says no to that unless they're playing a bigger game. Okay, and that gets into internal IT support, which is a very interesting conversation. Some of you here might be those people, so I need to be very specific when I say that I'm not painting everyone with the same brush but really there's kind of three brushes that you have you have IT people who have their own little kingdom they the people that you know you, you have IT staff and organizations IT is its own department they have their own like CIO or departmental managers and stuff and when they see themselves as their own kingdom right and the, and the, and and, they, and 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 say you're making cars your, your General Motors or Ford or Toyota or BMW or someone. And you're making cars and your IT department thinks the world revolves around them, you've got a problem, okay? Um, IT teams are supposed to support the underlying mission. If you're an automotive manufacturer, you're, you're to support information technology for the people who design and build the cars, okay? And they would say, oh yeah, they understand that, but their actions would belie that. Now, if you're from Toyota or Honda, wherever, I'm not talking, just that's an example, but I run into this all the time. And so the three types of people are the people that will stand in the way, the people who are non-committal, don't care, and would rather you leave them alone, or people that will actively engage who are enthusiastic. Most of the people, actually, about half of them are uh, negative, right? And because largely, people have a natural predisposition towards wanting to use a technology they're familiar with. So, for example, uh, who was it? David? Up, 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 up. Who was the person who was? One of you guys was uh, six years, uh, David or e, uh, Elzo, or one of you, well, I can't remember which person it was, you guys are all talking, um, was saying that they used to do DBase and Access. Why did you switch? What if you were an IT person and instead of using Access or DBase, you were a Microsoft SQL person and you had that investment and, and basically that was your thing. And you have people who understand a technology and that's all they're gonna do. Even if you come to them and show them that other tools might be better, right? It won't matter because as far as they're concerned, everything should be this one product. For example, file, I, I flip side of this, you go to a FileMaker person like me, and, I, and I, what I tell you earlier, FileMaker solves most problems, but it's not perfect for everyone. You have some people who think that their tool is the right for everything. That's the old, uh, I'm gonna, I have a, no matter what the tool is, it looks like a hammer or a screwdriver, so you use it no matter what, right? So you're running around the house trying to kill a fly with a hammer, right? Wrong, because that's the tool you have and that's the tool you learned and you love. You have to kind of get beyond that. And if you have IT people and you see this behavior, you have to figure out a way of getting them to get beyond that because they will be in the way. Now, of course, I run into some organizations where the IT staff are fantastic. They, they, they realize they don't know FileMaker. They think FileMaker might be useful because it's owned by Apple and, and, and therefore they want to check it out and they want to learn more, but they know they don't know it. So they, they bring in a developer or someone who's experienced and they have them help them teach them so they can do it, right? So those are two opposite sides. And what ends up happening is that that whole conversation pivots the, the, the decision that you have to make here, which is what we had yesterday, which is do you use FileMaker Server or FileMaker Cloud? Really, the first thing you have to decide is do you have IT support? If you have IT one, I mean, a small organization might not have it, but if you have IT support, are they negative? Are they neutral? Um, where they just don't care, leave them alone, or they're actively engaged. If they're actively engaged, you can do FileMaker Server or Cloud. If they're neutral and they just wanna be left alone to do their own thing, or they're actually negative, you just have to go with cloud, right? Um, that's the option that you have. That's the only thing you can do. Because otherwise, they're gonna get in the way and stop projects, 
right? So, so it was kind of funny. We, um, uh, this happened really recently, and <laughs> some of the people from this customer might actually show up and watch this video. It's kind of funny. Um, and this is all from my senior engineer. So a customer calls me. I'm talking to the CEO of this company, and he's a visionary. He's a smart guy, and he's got this. He does his business, and he has uh, hundreds of employees. And, and they have a database system, and it's been built, and it's been added on to. And I don't know that really anything necessarily, there was nothing really wrong with the, the business, the building process, other than FileMaker tends to be organically created, which means that you build it because you solve a problem, and then you add on to it, and you add on to it. And eventually, you add on to it so many times that it needs to be kind of rebuilt. Well, the customers kind of got themselves in that spot. And for example, my team visits them, and they say, hey, we have these scripts that we run on the server. So a script does a PSOS script. The server's running the script for you, not the client, but the server runs it. The server takes 26 hours to run a script that we need run every day. And, and everyone just heard me correctly. If you're going, if you're, if you didn't under, if you, if you're, if you're not paying attention, you don't know what I said. But basically I have a customer that, or we have, it's not even really a customer, it's people that we talk to who insist on bending the laws of physics, right? And so they try to figure out how to stuff 26 hours into a 24 hour day. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how that works. And that was all before, that was with everyone in the office working in the office and then everyone had to work out of the office. So then what happens, right? And so this, or, this customer has some FileMaker guys that people, guys, I guess, guys or gals, whatever. And they're, they're competent, they're good, they're learning, they're smart people. Great. Then there's IT folks in the organization who, I guess, initially say, yeah, it sounds great, but then, out, then they go out of their way to kill the project. And before long, they've managed to, the CEO can't keep an eye on them continuously. They're running around behind them causing mayhem. And before long, they end up derailing the project or killing it. Now, I don't know what their overall end solution is besides it goes slower and slower and slower until someone gets fired, I guess. I have no idea. But I mean, if, you, if anyone could figure out how to stuff 26 hours into a 24-hour uh, day, I want to hear about that. That's pretty cool stuff. Um, all right, so I'm scrolling down. Um, yeah, so Elzo says he fell in love with FileMakers. It was so easy. That's true. That's true. Um, uh, okay, so yeah, so I want to come back to IMOG's conversation about, um, you know, taking FileMaker with you to a new organization. Because once again, this is kind of like, hey, and then there's uh, uh, John there from New Jersey. That's awesome, John. So, um, so understand that IT support, really what you want is either have them to be neutral where they don't care and they just go off in their corner and do whatever and leave you alone that's okay because uh, then they really not actively working against you um, or you have an uh, IT organization that's really positive and, and optimistic and wants to be involved and of course if, if FileMaker sucks they'll be the first to tell you but if they're being if they're evaluating things legitimately and you can show true return on investment ROI then you know I always I, I don't mind hard people as long as they're fair I don't mind hard at all because that's the world we live in and if I can't show that it make it's it's good, it makes you money, it saves you time and money, then, you know, then I shouldn't be here. So, um, and I think all of you kind of understand that. So, um, so John's working on stuff, and, uh, and so I mog out a question, and I, I guess we could d dive into the conversation now a little bit. So, a lot of times FileMaker, and this gets back to what I try to explain to Claris, and they don't get it. Um, and this is the whole why client, why, why pro should be free. Um, so IMOG is a classic example of why FileMaker Pro should be free. So, um, so here's IMOG. IMOG's a guy who has probably his own copy of FileMaker Pro. He doesn't probably have server, although he probably should go and get the $99 copy of FileMaker developer subscription, which gets you a server with three connections. It's for development specifically. 99 bucks a year It's good money to spend. In addition to the awesome training that you can see here at fmtraining.tv. In addition, however, back to topic. Um, if FileMaker Pro was free, he could take it to the new organization. If he left an organization, went to the new organization, and he took Pro with him, and he had some sample files, or he took them starting point, please, by all means, take them and show starting point. If you want to take credit for it to help get it in the organization, whatever works for you, okay? Uh, 
But the point is, is that take them and show them something and get them engaged. And if you had pro for free, you could legally do that. Right? You could take it to the organization, you could install on in some people's machines, they could play with it. And then the organization would say, wow, well, we want to try this in a shared mode, right? So then you could get a trial if you wanted to, but, but probably you just buy a five pack for a thousand bucks or whatever it is, um, depends on whether it's server or cloud, and you get them running on that. But it's a conversation that starts for free because iMog has taken the conversation, taken the initiative, gone to them, and FileMaker has empowered him to take it there and to show it without him having to try to, well, I took this copy of FileMaker from my previous employer and I never really uninstalled it and I had it on my personal computer and I guess I should not have it anymore because it was licensed to them. Why have that conversation? So IMOG is your advocate. He's selling it into the new organization because he's an advocacy of FileMaker. So this is an ROI conversation. What, would, what might IMOG do? He could sell it a 30 or 40 seat license to FileMaker. There might be $5,000 that FileMaker wouldn't get otherwise. And that's on an annual basis, right? Maybe it's 30, 40, who knows, right? But then, and that, then that generates more advocates because some of the people in the organization, assuming they, they're not IT and they don't hate you, they see the value of it and they go, oh, that's really great. But then they leave that company and they go somewhere else too. And it kind of spreads like a stupid virus, right? It gets sticky on people. Success spreads. It's like it, when you're successful and people want to touch you and be around you, it's just the way it is, right? When you're successful, people want to learn from that. If IMOG is successful, he goes in there and they see him be successful, everyone's going to want to be like IMOG. They're going to want to be like David. They're going to want to be like Elzo. They're going to want to be like all you people here. Um, and so you want to be successful. So cool. Um, yeah, so iMog, you could do the 98. So he says, well, what if I just do the $99 deal and then that would give me the basic server and it gives me three connections? Yeah, if I really had to, I mean, listen, FileMaker's cloud demo right now is a real mess. Um, if you buy it, it works great. But if you try to do the demo, it works for two weeks. If you can get it to kind of, you got to get a hold of them. They have to kind of bless you with it. There's no automatic process where you have to actually get a person there to actively directly engage with you. Um, and so my suggestion is, as much as it would be great to have cloud, see the reason FileMaker doesn't want to do, because every time they spin up a cloud two instance, once again, this is, nah, nah, I'm, you can draw your own conclusions. Every time they spin up a cloud two instance, they have to pay for that. Now what, now, what kind of deal does Apple get with Amazon as a discount for spinning up a demo on a machine for two weeks or four weeks? How much did that really cost them, right? And what's the value, the benefit on the flip side? Anyway, so uh, given that, that, that won't be easy to do. The easiest thing to do, that's why I bought it. I bought the product because it was just easier to buy it and quit arguing with everyone about the demos, right? So um, get the FileMaker FDS. It's a legit one year legal license for server, three connections. As a developer, you could use it to develop and to obviously demo and show the customer. Once the customer wanted it, then, or your new employer, whoever that is, then you would they would buy a five pack or 10 pack. If you need help buying and you wanna get a, a deal on the sale, Send us an email. Send us an email to support at RC Consulting and Ryan Correa. I have a dedicated sales guy. He will, he will save you some money. I guarantee he will give you a deal. Especially if you tell him you're from our live training and say, "Hey, Richard says I can get a deal." Okay. So, uh, moving along. Um, so types of projects, right? So I'm going to cover something here. If you're internal, then maybe this is not such an issue, um, unless different groups are paying your time within the organization. But the idea is that there's two kinds of, well, historically there have been two kinds of development processes. One's this waterfall where it's kind of like almost like a government contract, or at least historically the government contracts of old where, um, I don't know how it is these days with the way things are going because the government's moving at kind of high speed, but historically the US government, I know, in the state of California historically, painful organizations to deal with. Um, they will write a specification, and then they will um, write this long document out, pages, 25 pages or something, right? And, and, then, and then they will have all these, and all these requirements in there, then you have to put a price on it. And everywhere where they're kind of vague in there, 
you have to kind of guess how much that's going to cost and you got to put it in there so then you have this locked on kind of cost and development that's called a waterfall process a uh, waterfall is typically how people control costs it's not how they have the best product um, the best product is a spiral development where you build it and the customers keep saying, well, yeah, but if FileMaker can send a PDF with an email and then talk to PayPal and then blah, 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 blah. We want to add that, all that stuff, blah, 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 blah. And then suddenly there's more time, there's more cost, but then FileMaker really is tuned for that customer's situation. That's called a spiral development process. So really spiral leads to highly tuned solutions that really meet the customer needs. It also leads to customers being pissed off because they realize how much money they spent and they get mad. Um, the waterfall process, you know how much it's gonna cost, but in flight, if you wanna change a bunch of stuff or whatever, it's a paperwork nightmare and most people just try to avoid that and then you end up with, well, you asked for this bologna sandwich and you had no idea I could make roast beef for you, right? But you got bologna because that's when you wrote the spec, it's all you said in the specification. Now, the alternative to that is some processes kind of like agile and agile is strictly speaking is it has its own set of rules it's interesting um i try to do kind of like agile agile light something like that kind of a mix of agile and those other processes the idea is is that the customer says we want to do some work and we let the customer give us a fixed cost quote or we will provide them a fixed cost quote but only for a little nugget of features not for the whole solution only for a couple days of work maybe a week of work max we will give them a quote high and low frequently. That way they know what the range is depending upon how they behave, like if they start, you know. And of course, what this does, very important for both the, both the customer and the developer, I mean, even if you're in-house, you want to work with people, and you need to manage their expectation when they're going to see it. If you're an outside developer, you have to manage when they're going to see it and how much they're going to, they're going to, they're going to pay. So really you want the customer and the developer to be happy with that. And so the trick is is to... If the customer had, everyone's different. And I like, I have a customer who makes manufacturers aircraft, like giant aircraft and fighter jets and stuff like that. You can guess who that customer is. Um, you take your three guesses to get it. It's not, it won't be the first couple you guess. And this man, this customer is interesting because they like fixed cost quotes, but they don't like to provide the details up front. And, and they don't like, and they like it to be sufficiently vague. So the developer takes the risk. That's really, it gets back to these other ideas where you've seen in books, and I could, I could have get into it here, but it's kind of like, oh, well, they want this to be a win-win situation, right? And there's these books, I could bring it up, but the, there are these different ideas where, like, I've had met with business people before. Their idea of winning is when you suffer, okay? They get what they want. They pay the lowest price possible, and, and you give them free stuff, Okay. Those people are extraordinarily short-sighted. They just are. Um, and, and they might be super successful in the world, but no one wants to work for them. So in some ways, and I have some customers like that, and we've kind of slowly worked away from those customers. And, and, and so you run into this situation where the win-win is where the customer provides the best information they can, and they try to be reasonable, and you try to do your best to provide them value, and then you meet in the middle when, you know, like if you have a little one-week process, you know, like what if it's a six-month project? You break it into weekly or two weekly, two weeks at a time chunks, and then you kind of stop and review, and that gives you time to adjust the course, right? So if you learn that the customer tends to um, add items that they never discussed before and they're not in the spec then you have to learn to manage that well it's better to learn to manage that two weeks in or four weeks in to a six-month project than at the six months when it's over because at, at two weeks in it's early you can adjust things i'm just telling you it's there's things that you learn in business and you really like you really value the customers where it's a win-win and like i said i i've dealt with customers um you know, Steve Jobs was like this. Uh, he would have times where he was like a win-win guy, and then the other times where it was screw, even if you work for Apple, it was screw you, right? I want what I want, I, I'm, I'm the brilliant person, I am infallible, and I'll get whatever I want, you know, at, at my price, even if you go out of business trying to deliver it. Um, in an ideal business situation, both sides have to give. The customer is gonna pay more than they probably want, and the developer is going to probably deliver more features than they than they want to deliver for that price. That's really a win-win. But then at the end of the, at the end of the project, both groups are happy. They're together. They value each other, right? Um, so that's really important. So uh, 
yeah, so ELLZO was talking about it, and then, oh, Dr. Pollard's here. Hey, awesome. Uh, good. Hey, nice to see you there. I think you got it. Cool. All right, so uh, questions about this. We had uh, we got Ed Burkle in St. Louis, Missouri. Awesome, Ed. I'm glad you're here. Once again, everyone, you can watch us on both YouTube or Twitch. I tend to prefer Twitch because YouTube has a way of just wanting to distract you with crap. Um, and uh, But there are periodic commercials in, uh, in uh, probably both of them, but certainly on Twitch. And if you don't like the commercial, then you can pay a dollar a month or something and they remove the commercials for you. Um, so that's kind of this idea of this process is of working with customers and start off with little small nuggets, little small projects. Once again, low, low, hanging, low hanging fruit, good ROI, something small, provide a low and a high. And if you're internal, then you want to provide them like the low is uh, it'll take me a week or the high and the high is two weeks. If we're an outside developer, we have to provide a time frame and a dollar amount uh, cost that they're going to expect to see. So um, as you're going through and helping customers, you're going to want to find processes that are um, going to, you can automate with, with APIs. Now, some of you asked about, hey, I want some API training. Uh, you say it like it's a, a bean burrito and we're going to have a bean burrito and then you're going to know everything. Uh, API, learning to code APIs is like learning to make all the menu items at Taco Bell, okay? It's a process that takes some time. It, it Realistically, if you're a fairly seasoned developer, you could probably learn it hardcore in two or three days, all day of training. Um, we can cut the corner for you on some of that. We can do some training on this, but um, there's, a, you know, there's some bits and pieces to it. And it's not just a FileMaker thing. APIs are a worldwide uh, phenomenon, right? And of course, there have been APIs that have been available for the FileMaker platform. FileMaker it was either 16 or 17, really added some deep hooks. I think it was 17 that really made it um, great really made it great uh, they they uh, they added the curl options once again if you don't that it's just basically when you communicate with apis back and forth in plain english the api is a communication you're, you're sending url commands like http blah 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 to their server they do something and then send that back to you right um, at the end of the day that's kind of what apis are but there are extra options in that url that are hidden a lot of them are called curl options etc those are extra items that are in that url that you can't see. And you can only put those together in an application that allows you to do that. There's an application called Postman. It's a great training application, a great diagnostic tool that allows you to type in things and then shoot them to the API service to see what comes back. You can also say, have Postman target a FileMaker server and bring data back, right? Uh, very cool stuff. Uh, so that's really neat technology. Claris bought a company called Stamplay, and they uh, it was a very kind of a basic uh, technology uh, platform that was based in Europe. And it had a bunch of CAN kind of uh, API capabilities in it. And Claris is busily trying to engineer and bring it into the platform. Um, it was soft launched by Claris, I don't know, three or four weeks ago. And the reality with that product is, is that it's still really new. It was soft launched because it really wasn't ready for prime time. Um, I think if it was debugged and ready, um, then um, it would have been big fanfare and marching bands and all this kind of stuff. And basically, they'd promised everyone they would ship it. And so instead, instead of pushing it back um, and missing the deadline, they shipped um, kind of a buggy application. Um, so it's, uh, it's kind of pricey. Um, I think, I don't know. I mean, I guess it, it depends on how you compare it with other things in the market. It depends what you need to do. But if you're going to, say, do an API, uh, say you want FileMaker to talk to PayPal. Um, you could look at what the cost will be with Claris Connect. You can look at what the cost will be with, um, for example, uh, Zapier is a third-party service. So Claris Connect is designed to compete with something like Zapier. Zapier is the mature product and market that um, basically everyone is chasing right now if you're at least in my opinion i mean there's other things that are out there i think microsoft is doing some things and i think filemaker or claris is primarily chasing microsoft on this a little bit a lot of times filemaker is ahead of microsoft but in this area they're behind the api i mean being an api providing service right where they say hey you know here's claris connect the idea with claris connect is that oh i want to do paypal okay then you drag it over here and, and it integrates and you can connect the scripts and do the stuff um 
I just know that when they were getting in, in launch mode, we launched it the next day. Uh, we were ready to demo the product, and uh, Claris basically went into our demo files and deleted all our demo files and uh, basically erased our account so we couldn't demo it the next day. And then they told us we had to buy it, which was really awesome. So um, once again, how to piss off your, uh, your sales team that's free, right? If you have developers and they help your product and they're free, um, then you just don't want to antagonize them unnecessarily. At least that's my strategy in life, but I ain't in charge, okay? So, um, anyway, so it's really kind of fun. Um, live code is interesting. Um, I guess we can bring that up. Uh, so, ah, yes. So, live code um, is another development platform. It, uh, I guess in a lot of ways comes from the world of HyperCard way back in the day. I think there's some lineage there, or it was real basic, and before that it was HyperCard. But basically, a live code is a cross-platform development uh, platform. Um, FileMaker Go can make really great um, native iOS applications. It doesn't do native Android at all, zero. And so we, when we built a, I built a training app for a uh, basically a law enforcement operation. It did uh, instruction and training and security. And what ended up happening with that is that they we ended up using, uh, we were thinking about using FileMaker Go, but FileMaker Go really doesn't, you know, if you use the iOS app SDK, which is how you take Go, you bind, you bind the application together and you put it in the Apple App Store. Except Claris came out and said, we don't want you to do that because we don't, we don't want you to do that. We're scared of that. We don't want to do that. I'm like, great. So, so we dumped FileMaker, RCC dumped FileMaker on that, and we built the application with live code uh, on, on the Android platform specifically. We used an application called Titanium for um, on the Mac, on the iOS side, but in retrospect, we should have used live code for all of it. And uh, we had to have to put a plugin in it. So live code is interesting. So once again, we largely love FileMaker, but between politics and decisions and things like that, it's not always the best tool for the job. So, questions um, from other people? Let me see if I have a slide below this. I don't know if I have a slide. So, uh, other other tips and, and tricks to keep yourselves out of trouble? Uh, the benefits and behaviors of a great developer. Understand, this is where experience comes from. If you're brand new to the FileMaker platform or you're kind of a low time pi uh, person in general, like you're 25 and you've been in the IT business and you think you're the cat's pajamas, like you're that awesome, there's things you're going to get hammered on and you need to learn from that. So first off is that if you run FileMaker Server, make sure you have backups. FileMaker Server does not generally automatically create quality backups. It just doesn't do that. If you use FileMaker Cloud 1 or 2, it creates backups that are automatic. FileMaker Cloud 2, one of the things we did not demonstrate um, whenever we covered that technology. Um, was that yesterday? Did we cover that yesterday? Might have been yesterday. It's been a long couple of days with everything in my life. It's very busy. Um, the rest, the the restoration, like say Sally's in the database and she deletes 500 records and, and there's no one due for the de delete command in FileMaker. Well, you need to roll to a backup. Rolling to a backup in FileMaker server, as long as you have access to the machine, it's not too hard. You can remote control in the machine and do what you need to do. FileMaker Cloud 1's a pain in the butt. It's one of those areas where FileMaker Cloud was really painful. Cloud 2 it is a snap. It's easy. It's awesome. I really love that about that. We didn't demonstrate that, but it's like really awesome. Um, and then, of course, then if you're still using peer-to-peer, -peer, I have some of you here who are in love with peer-to-peer. -peer, you would marry it, um, and I understand that. But I think the next uh, the next best thing is to get into the FileMaker developer subscription and uh, go down that road and save yourself some money doing that because that gives you a FileMaker server with three connections, and you can and the idea is that you test uh, Pro on it at one time, Mac or Windows, and then you, and you can also simultaneously test Go on your iPad, right? And then you can also simultaneously test WebDirect, which theoretically is your Android client, right? It doesn't have to be Android. It just people tend to use it for that. Um, okay, so questions about that from anyone? Are expenses charged on top of the cost of doing a project? Um, that's from Elzo. Hey, David, are you there? Am I hearing you? I don't. I, I see a question yes, from right Elzo. Here. So let me answer Elzo's question, and then we'll go. Um, 
back that. So our expenses charged on top of the cost of doing the project. Um, well, basically, you have to work that all out in advance. Okay, so here's one of those little tips in life. Customers don't like surprises, okay? If you're in-house, they don't like surprises. If you're a developer that's outside, like myself, they don't like surprises. And so if you have expenses, you foresee expenses, then you need to let the customer know in advance and they can decide to pay the expenses or not. If they don't want to pay the expenses, then you as a developer need to decide if you want to do the project. Once again, we're back to that win-win quadrant, right? Not where the customer uh, loses and you win, that's bad. Or the customer wins and then you work for free for a bunch, that's bad. Some customers think that's great, but then that results in you not wanting to ever work for them ever again and they lose access to that resource. Um, cool. Uh, Jacob Taylor. Oh, there's Jacob going. Okay, Jacob is here. Hi, Jacob. Woo! So, here's our in-house ace hitter. So, uh, if you have questions about um, server, uh, Cloud One, Cloud Two, any of that kind of stuff, you want some support at RC Consulting, Jacob will uh, see that message and respond to you. If you need help setting up servers or dealing with that kind of stuff, he's the guy we're going to send to you, okay? He's not free, to be clear, but he uh, he's one of the best I've ever seen in this line of work, just in terms of just doing with servers and the management of that. I mean, I'm just one of the best people I've seen. Uh, really happy to have him at RCC. So uh, other questions. I, it might be the end of the slides here. Yes, I'm kind of towards the end of my, my slideshow here um, in terms of what we're doing. Um, and it's about 45 minutes after the start. Um, and so let's see. So questions go on, David. Questions? No questions on my end either. Okay. So once again, the videos, uh, YouTube or uh, F, uh, Twitch should be 1080. You can do 1080 if your internet connection will allow for that. Um, we are broadcasting on 1080. So I think Twitch by default is always 1080. And then over here, I'm looking at um, YouTube in its super low resolution, just because I think. It's doing it like it. Uh, it's doing it 144, which is like the resolution of a Nokia phone in you know 1995 or something. I don't know. It's so. Uh, actually, yeah, I'd be about right. 93, 94, 95. Yeah. So, super low resolution, but allows me to kind of see where we're at. So, questions uh, from anyone? So yeah, John with an 80 of a server five pack. So. So you want an AWS dev server. Okay, I missed the conversation. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, I'm missing the conversation that they are. Obviously, it's one of those conversations that's almost, I need to see it threaded. I can't see where it begins. David, you have questions for me? Nope, I believe we've covered most of them. That conversation started with someone asking, is an in-house server set up still an option? And then Jacob came in and answered it. Yeah, so in-house servers, I mean, um, and I know that a lot of you here are kind of kind of in and out uh, of, of some of these events. We're doing training events every day of the week, not on Saturdays and Sundays for the moment, um, but Monday through Friday at 1 o'clock Pacific time here in California. So... We've covered the conversation about deployment. I'm happy to talk about it briefly. FileMaker Server works on Mac or Windows and theoretically in the future on a Linux version. And then, so there's installers, I guess, for eventually will be for all three. Right now it's Mac and Windows. So where the Mac or Windows server is is up to you. It could be under your desk down here on the floor or it could be up in a server room with a rack and batteries and all that stuff. Or it could be on Amazon. So when, for FileMaker Server, that's Windows kind of goes everywhere. Um, so really, just because you have FileMaker Server doesn't mean it has to be in the office or in the cloud. It can go either way. Because we that's where we use Amazon, AWS with EC2, uh, Elastic, Cloud Compute. It's just stupid virtual servers. It's, you're renting, literally renting a virtual server by the second or nanosecond or whatever it is. I mean, no one sees that, but that's they, they try to charge you by the minute or by the hour. It's really bizarre. Because I know whenever someone spins up a server, almost never I see it for the hour. It's always like for the next six months or at least a year. Because that's the way FileMaker subscriptions are a year. So if you buy a server license for a year, you're going to put it on a server at least for a year. Right? So, um, Yeah, Dr. Pollard. Yeah, that's a great comment there, of course. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, 
that's really great, Doctor Pollard. Yeah, no, I, I, no, John's a good guy. John, John Pollard is one of the most picky people uh, I think I've met. But he gets up there and he gets right in people's faces if they're blowing it or screwing up. And I've, I've seen him chew <laughs> butt on some people at Claris before. So um, it's an interesting operation. I, I th and then once again, that, that's where Claris needs feedback from you. If you folks think you should have something or need something or why isn't this being addressed send them a mail and if you don't know who to send it to then look up their company directory and see who the executive team is and pick the executive you want to mail it to and mail it to them don't tell them i told you to do it just do it right um because a lot of times you'll send a message to someone and if you can make a pretty articulate case especially to a senior executive remember most of the seniors executives at filemaker don't use filemaker at Claris, right? They don't use it. They don't sit there at home. Like right now, they're at home or wherever they're at. They're not using FileMaker. There's no way. Um, they're do busy being executives at Apple, right? You know, meeting and meeting and PowerPoints and I'm sure Word files and keynotes and whatever else they do. But, um, you know, I used to see Dominique, who was a former CEO at FileMaker. He was in Excel all the time running price analysis on how much he should charge and stuff. And I understand Excel having a value for that in that kind of situation. But I think X, I, I think if Dominique had to build a FileMaker app, I think he'd have choked, right? So, um, which is really too bad. I mean, I, I, I like to see managers who, <laughs> it's, it's like the, uh, God, it was the, it was the, uh, a Samsung vice president or president someone. It was about a year ago. And he was sending message, Samsung's great, Samsung's this. And then down below, he he wasn't the swiftest bulb in the operation. The message said, sent from an iPhone. Because that's that little default setting on the iPhone where it says, sent from an iPhone. And so he was talking about how great Samsung's were. He's using an iPhone to do it. Yep, so. That's like driving around in a in a in a uh, BMW telling me how great a, a GM is, right? Or something like that. It's just, yeah, so anyway. All right, cool. I'm drinking my water, trying to stay hydrated. So tomorrow, let's talk about future training here, right? So I'm going to go ahead and close this out. So I'm going to close that. I'm going to hide. Uh, once again, I have my button here. I can hide all the icons on my desk. Wait a minute. It didn't, is it not running? Where is that at? The application is called Hide... Hide, hide me pro and I make sure it's running maybe it's not running and I have a, a sh keyboard shortcut on my one of my function keys and so it hides all the other items on my desktop so I'm not distracted by them yay right I'm gonna go ahead and make myself super small <laughs> complete with sound effects now tomorrow is an interesting day tomorrow's April Fool's this is the schedule um, and we also have previous recordings that are available um, so tomorrow is going to be April Fool's. Tomorrow is a lot like an open-ended conversation. So if you have specific questions, that's fine. We're going to talk about things not to do, more technical in the FileMaker platform, um, areas to stay uh, out of trouble. That would be great. Um, and today, of course, obviously, five habits of successful business, more likely the uh, 20 good things to do if you're a FileMaker advocate or developer and you want to be successful and you want your customers, uh, even in-house or out-of-house people to like you and love you. Um, just basic. I would assume it's common sense after 30 years, but I've seen brand new people I hire have no clue about it. And I remember back in the old days when I was like 24, I was like, had no clue either. But yeah, that's what, when you get old, <laughs> you learn all this, but then you're old, right? So, <laughs> so uh, yeah. So anyway, so that covers it for today. If you have questions about topics, we have the topic schedule, okay, I'm going to go and pop this up so you folks can see what's coming in the big scheme of things. If I go to FileMaker and I go to Recent and I go to CMS, this is our, this is the system that drives the website. So this is the website. This is done with uh, Data API or PHP. This is the data that drives it, right? Um, and so I can say show future events, and these are the future events that are coming up. And once they get to a certain point, we kind of lock them in. We don't change in flight. So these records are vertical, but they correspond to the records along here. Um, and so we have the ones through relationships. We're going to go back and talk about Anchor Buoy a little bit. And then uh, the following day is an open Q&A day. Um, 
and we'll see if you folks have any questions. Uh, next day is Data Viewer. We might have to bring Calvin back for the Data Viewer because he's uh, a ninja with that. Uh, we have another potential uh, open uh, Q&A day here. Um, and then we're going to be looking at a brand new product that's really inexpensive and what it does for you I think saves a lot of money. Some of you are going to really like this. It's called, um, one of my engineers put it together, it's really their product. Um, and it's it has it's a free but it also 79 bucks so it's kind of it's interesting because there used to be a thing we used to do a lot of called web reporting and the idea is that you know filemaker charges a ton really especially if you buy cloud 2 at the top price point $39 per user per month and really it's not for public access so what if you want public easy public access to your database with some sort of report um, that's secure this tool does it cheap. You don't have to do a lot of coding. It kind of pre-builds things for you. It's really quite neat. It's called the uh, uh, it's called the uh, Web Portal Wizard. I think there's a website for it. Um, I don't know if the website's public yet. Um, definitely don't try to download it yet. But I'm just giving you an alert. I think we're finalizing the product in there, and then uh, we'll be doing web showing talking about web reporting um, on that. Uh, my engineers put a ton of time into it. So if he wants 79 bucks uh, for the product. You want to save yourself a ton of time and money, spend the 79 bucks. Uh, keyboard shortcuts coming up after that. I guess I could zoom in on this a little bit. You guys probably can't see that too well. So uh, that's relationships, open Q&A, data viewer, more questions and answers. Um, Web portal wizard on uh, April 13th, April 14th, keyboard shortcuts, Q&A, script debugger in the FileMaker platform. Uh, on the 16th and then so these open Q&A's can be adjusted in flight um, we can change them to uh, a specific topic if you folks have a topic like something pops up or we can't get to something then that allows us to do that uh, for you uh, and so we've been working the tools menu overview and then once again we're going to go back and officially do a custom menus uh, event some of you've already seen that which case you can skip the event if you want so we're coming up on two o'clock local time or the top of the hour and uh, tomorrow yeah we well, yeah, are going to get the the t-rex for tomorrow i'm going to get it out i don't know how long i can sit here because it's like a little oven in there and i'm going to put the headset on inside the t-rex head and so you won't see my facial expression you just see the t-rex t-rex head bobbing around here so uh, we'll see how long i can do that before i uh overheat and pass out so um and then what was tomorrow again if i go to if i go to future events oh april fools yeah okay so wait yeah there's a couple yeah a couple things that are jokes in there and then other things that you guys you folks will think are jokes but they're real right so things not to do in your file maker file right so uh some of it should be an april fools joke but it's it's really real it's kind of it's kind of embarrassing you don't want to like admit to it it's like very bad. So with that, I'm going to cut everyone loose. We've got good questions. Trex tomorrow. Awesome. I'm Richard Carlton with the help of David Castillo, Miles Gebski, and the rest of the Richard Carlton Consulting team, including Christian Olson and Jacob Taylor, who I think are trolling around helping answer questions. You guys are awesome. Thanks for being part of one of the best FileMaker teams in the world. Seriously. Seriously. It's really quite good. All right. Thanks, everyone. See, I, I normally do that and then something happens, right? You do it dramatically. I thanks everyone and then you hit a button. Stepped up the whole way. Calm, cool, collected the quarterback. Great read.
good patience, more importantly, great job up front protecting this quarterback to give you a chance, and that's all you can ask for. Try to rally, down 10, 9.25 to go here in the fourth. Short motion by Amendola from the left. Brady takes the shot, goes stands in, throws it left for Amendola, reaches up and snaps a high throw and lands inside the 10. Rolling to the 9. Ball slightly behind him, again he makes the grab.